the, because also I am fine, but there are several online also lecturers and people who, who are also waiting for us. Maybe they don't have this nice coffee as we had, but <laughs> okay. Welcome back and let us restart. I will uh, again restart, will give a short presentation on the overview of, uh, let me just overview of innovative reactor designs. We will receive a lot of, a lot of information about these reactors in coming in this week and I will just quick, uh, will give you a quick overview. First of all, I will explain the classification, how we do it, and what is the difference between GIF terminology, IA terminology. There are several nuances, you know. That's. We will give a quick comparison of the coolant physical properties, which defines uh, actually the type of the reactor and its features. I will show you six GIF generation for reactor concepts and also give you b brief status of the fast reactors, current status of the fast reactors in the world. So, you know, the Generation for International Forum is a big organization which uh, joined several mm, countries who are interested in developing and the innovative so-called generation for reactors. And they define like uh, generation one is the early prototypes and demonstration plants. So let's say first nuclear power plants. The current flint of the nuclear reactors is generation two or three. And advanced nuclear reactors can be evolutionary and innovative. Uh, actually, this generation three, three plus, and generation four of GIF. Uh, correspond to the evolutionary and innovative reactor design as defined by International Atomic Energy Agency. We design evolutionary, it's a reactor for advanced reactors which small uh, changes in the design, just uh, evolutionary changes. No new technologies applied mostly for the water-cooled fast reactors. And then reactor becomes of generation three becomes generation three plus, according to the GIF terminology sometimes. And innovative reactor designs, which correspond to generation four terminology of GIF. In this case, also SMRs, small and medium sized or modular reactors or whatever, can be either evolutionary or innovative. Evolutionary, which is prototypes were already done for the transportable units or icebreakers in Russia and others. This is evolutionary designs and there are several innovative designs which use different coolants and different technologies. The details you can check in the IEA Advanced Reactor Information System, ARIS, which is the link here, or you can simply search and see all these advanced reactors, both innovative and uh, evolutionary. Also, this is like, you know, terminology which is depends on the times. What is today innovative could be evolutionary tomorrow, or, or what is advanced today could be just evolutionary tomorrow and so on. Generation 3 is more or less like Cartesian system and evolutionary innovative is like, like Lagrangian system. You always move with, with these reactors. But anyway, it's there are small difference in terminology. Uh, because of the different member states and different organizations can be, be used. More or less generally, it's Gen4. Okay, if you look at the Generation 4 International Forum, the goal, uh, they postulate several goals what they want to reach with this Generation 4 reactor. Sustainability, economics, safety and reliability, prolif proliferation resistance and physical protection. So, on, on, the, on the terms of safety and technologically, the GIF postulates that Gen4 nuclear, uh, nuclear energy system will eliminate the need of off-site emergency response. So, this uh, such as a ex severe accident, which large or quick release of uh, radioactive isotopes, 
so such kind of accidents will be practically eliminated. Practical elimination means it's, uh, is, a, is in principle physically impossible for some effects, or it's so, so low probability, so very low probability, very, very low, but it doesn't define probability, let's say, reactor, yes, or something, simply very low physical probabilities. These goals can be reached in generation for reactors, and in between you can have also, and those, of course, all these reactors in generation four are innovative by uh, IE uh, terminology as well. And partly, if you reach it only partly, it could be generation three plus, as, as Jeff says. In general, the reactors classif classified, as you probably know very well. Excuse me? Okay, please mute your microphones, the nice speakers. Anyway, in general, as you know very well, the reactors can be classified by moderator, coolant, fuel type, purpose, and power. For the moderator, it could be water, heavy water, graphite reactors, or for the fast neutron system, we don't have moderator, we try to avoid any moderation in the, in the. Then by coolant, it, again, it could be water, heavy water, liquid metals, sodium lead, all of this metal tactic, gas-cooled reactors, which can be cooled by air, CO2, and helium, and molten salt of, let's say, different types. If you look at the fuel, reactors can be fueled by uranium dioxide or MOX, I mean, mix of uranium dioxide and plutonium oxide fuels. Fuel can be also metallic, or it can be uranium or plutonium nitride, or carbides are also considered, but now nitride is considered as potentially uh, attractive fuel. And also molten salt can be, again, both as coolant and fuel. By purpose, uh, reactors can be defined also as for electrical application, uh, just to generate electricity, or for non-electrical application, such as producing heat for either for the uh, heating for the for the house heating i mean what do you call it district heating or for tech technological processes where you need high temperature heat or desalination and hydrogen production and other purposes which not directly related to electricity generation by power it could be low <coughs> middle or high power and also maybe the same as the size which related to smrs we will have a lecture later after this one. Uh, so GIF pro proposed six, yeah, sure, please. I'm asking about the fuel, like, now I'm uh, just interested in the silicide fuel. So, do you have any option? I mean, the idea on silica, uranium silicide fuel. I searched it. It's used for the research reactor fuel, but not for the electrical. Uh, I mean, the power reactor. So, why then they don't use the uranium silicide as a fuel for power reactor? Silicide. You don't know? <laughs> no, no. So maybe we can ask this question for the, for the, we will have expert, Alexander Bichkov on, on the fuel, so he can, for fuel cycles, he can, could be asked. Okay, uh, let's come back to, but the, the, there are different types of fuel. W what I put here, it's as a main, potentially. Of course, we can talk about the thorium cycle here and, and others, but they're more or less, uh, I don't want to say exotic, but future, future considered for future. Here just presented the main, main types of the fuel which already used and was implemented in, in, in the reactors. Okay, if you look at the six, GIF uh, proposed uh, six conceptual designs for the future reactors, which are very high temperature gas reactors, which is cooled by helium in thermal spectrum, SFR, sodium cooled fast reactor, Okay, obviously we know we will discuss a little bit more later. 
supercritical water cooled reactor, which can be thermal, work in thermal spectrum, fast neutron spectrum, or intermediate. This is this is cooled supercritical water. Also interesting, uh, at least it can work in fast spectrum as well. We have a gas cooled fast reactor, which is uh, also high temperature reactor cooled by helium, but working in fast spectrum compared to the very high temperature reactor, which is also gas reactor cooled by helium, but working in thermal spectrum. And temperatures are lower for the gas cooled fast reactor compared to VHDR. And lead cooled fast reactor, which also include lead or lead with metal tactic. And molten salt reactors, there are several types, can work on thermal or fast spectrum, and there are several uh, concepts. This is just compared to the neutron spectrum, coolant, and temperatures, and also requires this, uh, which ki what kind of fuel cycle? Open fuel cycle, closed fuel cycles means all um, nuclear materials are redeveloped and uh, everything is closed uh, in after, so uh, the fuel goes either to the thermal reactors or come back to the to the original reactor and uh, closing fuel cells means you don't have the waste. Most of the concept are closed except or two which can work in a thermal spectrum which are not closed. This uh, plot shows more or less these six concepts. Maybe you, I, I believe you already know this and you know the differences between those, between the systems. Let's say for the sodium cool, I know if, if I have this comparison, maybe I will go now a little bit to comparison for the coolants. What are the key physical properties we need, f we expect from coolant to be considered for the, as a reactor coolant? So melting temperature, or it should be, let's say, depends on how the reactor calls down temperature for fuel handling. If it's uh, frozen, it's one thing. If, of course, it's, it's better to have it, to have it uh, lower melting temperature is better, like for the water, for example. Boil, boiling point and liquid first temperature range is also very important because we want to avoid boiling point. I mean, we don't want to the coolant to boil. Sometimes it's unavoidable. For the water you need for this to, to increase this boiling point, you have to apply the high, very high pressure, like 17 megapascal or even more. And for the thermal characteristic, like heat capacity, lambda, which is thermal conductivity, plant number are important parameters. Higher heat capacity, better. Of course, higher thermal conductivity is better. We need also thermal stability of, the, of this coolant, so it should be stable. So for this pure, pure material, pure chemi chemical elements are pre preferable. The density of the react uh, of the coolant will impact on the pump pumping speed and other parameters such as seismic behavior. So higher density, like for the lead, it's not, sometimes it's a benefit, sometimes it's not beneficial. Very important uh, property which we should consider is interaction of the coolant with reactor structural materials, it, it, with steels. It, if it dissolves and corrosion and potential mass transfer, it's very important. And chemical reactivity with surrounding fluids like air, water, organic products, uh, etc. It's very important. Okay. And uh, I will also, there are also several important uh, key physical properties, which is I would select, highlight the transparency of opacity. For the transparent, like water or gas, it's easy in service inspection, but for non transparent, it's very complicated. There are any other, several others. Again, I want to shows that uh, availability of this material in nature. For example, water, we have a lot of water to, to, to do it, and we have unlimited resources of water. But when we go to the Wismut, we don't know, it's maybe not that many of this material in nature. And also cost is the last but not least parameter. It's not physical, actually, properties, cost, and availability in nature, but this is important uh, properties of the coolant. So, 
again for the fast reactor coolants we want first of all not to be uh, not to moderate so water is, is excluded in this case and other materials have to be used and also it could lead to the if you have high absorption relatively high absorption coefficient of neutrons you will have void reactivity effect means when you remove the coolant or for example when it boils and it's called void void is means just coolant is removed it's not actually void of course but then you have positive reactivity effect which can affect the safety of the reactor let's compare the like quickly the coolant thermal physical properties here presented for the all six GIF generating system so I would like to attract your uh, okay M melting point is important boiling point let's say for water is normally 100 only degree C but under high pressure which is 17 megapascal the boiling point for water is 350 it's still too low and then the reactor vessel under huge pressure which is potentially has uh, you know could uh, make a lot of um, destructive work if, if or if you have a leakage even or breakout of the of, of the vessel it could be potentially huge uh, huge mechanical work let's say physically sane or it destructive work in, in in principle to this to destroy the environment and the reactor and still it's only 350 which also for the coolant with this the efficiency total electrical efficiency efficiency of the plant is much lower maximum you can reach maybe 30 32 33 percent of efficiency so two sorts of energy you have to lose to the to the nature if you talk about the sodium it's uh, much higher and lead and lead bismuth even more high which is very beneficial for the lead so we we don't expect any boiling in case of lead and lead bismuth coolants for example for helium is uh, and, and other things it's <laughs> boiling point is already in gaseous states from from this very low temperature uh, low temperatures so we have to use the pressurized heavy pressurized uh, coolant in this case and for the several okay this is one one of the examples of the molten salt is about 1700 degrees Celsius, Celsius which is uh, also okay relatively high boiling point and we don't mm, there is no concern about this the density compared to water okay sodium is nearly slightly less density than water however <coughs> lead and lead bismuth is 10 times denser and heavy, heavier than water helium is also lighter than water in case <coughs> essentially is open i mean very very light but under high pressure when you go, we go to for 20 megapascal for helium it can reach like eight kilogram per cubic meter which is okay and uh, uh, molten salts are very dense so it means you need a lot of power for pump for pumping of this reactor so and another parameter properties physical properties is heat capacity and here specific heat capacity per kilogram you, s you see that water is the best the best coolant in the so higher heat capacity less coolant you need to remove the heat from the reactor okay very simple in this case uh, water is the best of course uh, and also helium is good if you take by kilogram but what is also important this volumetric heat capacity means how much uh, volume of the coolant you need to remove this not kilogram because at different density how much volume of this and then it defines your velocity of the coolant in the reactor so for water is uh, also very high and it's again the best uh, volumetric heat capacity uh, while for this by the compared like you see if you have specific heat capacity for lead it's <coughs> 10 times less than sodium but if you compare with volumetric heat capacity it's better than sodium in this case so you need uh, less velocity to remove heat from from the reactor with lead or lead bismuth than with sodium but still you need more uh, so so water is better in this case 
Thermal conductivity is a very important factor, which is, uh, so here sodium is the best, and it means that all temperatures, you, 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 so that the temperatures of the cladding of your pin, uh, all the lossy, uh, temperatures will be lo much, will be lower, and absolute temperatures and all maximum temperatures, but also the gradients, temperature gradients in this, within this cone will be much lower. In this case, sodium is the best, but lead and lead bismuth also have very good thermal conductivity. In case of molten salt, the, if you take this conductivity, is very low. However, for the molten salt reactor also, it's not important because at least in this design where this coolant is uh, also the fuel, so you don't need to transfer the heat from coolant to fuel because it's already the same thing. So you don't need this, and then this, this thermal conductivity does not play a big role unless you want to remove also this uh, heat from the coolant sooner or later in heat exchanger. Then it could be a problem, and then to reach this there. Uh, also, kinematic viscosity is an important factor because it shows how much uh, delta P pressure you need to, to pump this coolant through your, through your system. This is quickly explained traditional. Actually, sodium cooled fast reactors have a long history, and the first, uh, first reactor that generated electricity, and I, I I believe you know which reactor and when generated first electricity. EBR-1, yeah, correct. EBR-1, it was sodium potassium cool reactor, demonstrated reactor. Uh, it, yeah, yeah, only, only uh, yes. But actually, it, it's, uh, that increases several kilowatts, finally, of, of, of the power. But this was to demonstrate production of electricity. And that was sodium. And EBR means experimental breeder reactor. So the breeding possibility already considered on the first ever reactor that generated ele electricity. So, and that was sodium potassium alloy, what was the coolant there. So sodium cooled fast reactors have a long history, m I'm about 500 reactor years in operation, and it's mature technology. We can consider here mostly the pool type reactor when you have this big pool of sodium here, with a small, relatively small core inside, and, and uh, but this is nice design, and then he, you have, in, in, okay, just before I forget, so for the, because sodium reacts very aggressively with water, uh, with water, so you want to add intermediate heat exchanger to avoid direct contact of the radioactive sodium in the, pre sodium in the primary circuit with water of the secondary circuit. Then, we have to add the intermediate heat exchanger. And this heat exchanger is located in the reactor pool inside the reactor vessel. But this is like low power, uh, low pressure, sorry. Volume, which is like more or less ambient pressure, at, at least on the top of this reactor. However, this design doesn't work for the seismic areas like in Japan. So in this case, you also can consider loop type reactor where you have separate intermediate heat exchanger somewhere outside. So there are two, just wanted to say, there are two main types of the sodium cooled fast reactors. This slide shows uh, this history of these sodium SFRs, which I say it's mature technology. So we had several reactors in France, experimental Arab Saudi reactors, and again, experimental Phoenix. Super Phoenix was the first industrial reactor that it works very, you know, at, at, at on in operation for almost uh, 10 years, but it was never reloaded and was shut down in the end of last century for mainly for the political reasons, I believe. Germany was, <coughs> excuse me, uh, running the experimental KNK reactor and projected SNR 300 that was also stopped in operation. In Soviet Union, former Soviet, I mean, Russia and Kazakhstan, we had several reactors, Bor 60, then Bor 350 in Kazakhstan, Ben 600 and Ben 800, which I operate now in, in the near Ekaterinburg. And one, two SFRs are under design and construction, Ben 
12 conduit is under design, and Embir experimental reactor is under construction. Embir will, repra will replace Bor 60 reactor. Japan developed uh, and running the Joyo reactor, which is now shut down, but uh, awaiting the license for restart. It's a small experimental reactor. And Japan built Monju reactor, which was only working like uh, half a year. It was 260 megawatt electric, but after sodium leakage accident in the same year it started, the reactor was shut down and under decommissioning now. In the USA, as you remember, we have the CBR-1 and then several other reactor in operations. Last was FFTF, 400 megawatt, which was shut down in 92. There was a project and now it still exists VTR. It's a new design and several other actually uh, for, for the sodium natrium, for example. We'll talk about this later. And, but uh, okay, it's under design, let's say not under construction. India, in India, PF, FBTR operates since 1955, but it's a small experimental reactor. And PF bar, then you see this commission in 2021, we also expect this reactor to be commissioning every year, but unfortunately it's postponed. Maybe good because uh, they conduct very nice, a lot of tests to, to, to make sure that reactor operation is safe, there are no sodium leakages and so forth. India also developed several other reactors. In China, already more than 10 years in operation, it's CFR, China Experimental Fast Reactor, small reactor, 200 megawatt electric, but China now builds two, two CFR 600 reactors, which is under construction and expected in a few years to be built. Two exactly very similar, not very, exact, exactly the same reactor 600 megawatt and other reactors under design. So I think I should go maybe faster to, to, to complete this historical overview. So this slide shows uh, uh, pictures of the reactors which are in operation in several countries. Again, it's been 600 in Russia and been at Kangat recently since 2015 also in Russia. FBTR in India, CFR in China, PFBAR, it's under commissioning in India, expected again next year probably. And that is like five mi main reactors under operation in the world now, or expected to be starting operation in the world. Uh, <coughs> uh, there are several new innovative design which can be generation classified as generation four. It's BN 1200 in Russia, CFR 600 in China. It's, uh, this is difficult to identify, is it generation three plus or generation four? but it's under construction. And CFR 1000 in China, that will be generation for reactor. There was a project of European SFR, European sodium cool fast reactor, which was 1500 megawatt electric, but now the power is lower, and then it's like hypothetical reactor, I would say. There are several other, but they're not uh, really, uh, not say this is a paper reactor, but the, the development are postponed, wait, waiting for the political decisions and, and so on. Just to show you the evolution uh, of the reactors and uh, what is make its existing fleet evolutionary innovative, let's say BN-600 operates since 1985 <coughs> in Yekaterinburg in Russia. When we make when Russia made a new reactor BN-800, what is it similar? It's a similar, exactly the same, a very similar okay, sodium design of the reactor vessel and sodium circuits. Basic safety systems are also the same. Information control systems, including the reactor monitoring system, are the same. What is new for BN-800? It has additional, most important, passive uh, safety system, so-called hydraulically suspended contour rows. So when you have nominal flow, contour rod is out of the core, but when flow becomes lower, contour rod automatically inserted in the core, so the reactor shut down. It's a new, but only one uh, passive uh, sh shutdown system, 
and of course it has numerous other improvements, but still we consider, okay, uh, Russia considers this Ben 800 as a, a generation three plus reactor, not generation four. It's not enough safety system. But when Russia now is under design, designing Ben 1200, this is already industrial side, big power reactor, and what is innovative? This is, first of all, it's a proven technology based on the experience of the both previous Ben 600 and 800 reactors. However, there are several additions. For example, they postulate that accidents that require public evacuation are practically eliminated, and that is thanks to the passive shutdown system, inclu including these hydraulically suspended control rows and an additional passive high temperature actuated control rod system. The reactor will be using uranium platinum, plutonium nitride fu fuel, which is better, at least considered as better and safer as compared to the MOX fuel. It will have in the reactor core a lower power density and passive decay heat removal systems. And last but not least, it will be competitive with other advanced nuclear power plants and with power plants that use for sale fuel and of course with renewable as well. This makes this design generation four. Okay. Uh, maybe I will skip. There are several. Okay. The main improvement goes in to make it generation four. It's to make sure that all ac severe accidents are practically eliminated, and we can reach it using the different types of the passive shutdown system. And this slide shows several the shutdown systems, and even in case of the core meltdown, using the special dedicated core catchers, we can ensure that the, there will no be huge or quick release of the, <coughs> excuse me, of the radioactive material to the energy. So, uh, lead and lead bismuth uh, reactors were designed because sodium has very disadvantageous uh, uh, parameter, which is when sodium reacts with violently with water and or even on the air, sodium starts burning, fire, fire starts. But this is not that big style like gasoline or whatever, but still it doesn't require any ignition. So then you want to separate sodium and water. So then we, you have to implement this intermediate, in, intermediate circuit, which makes the cost of the reactor much higher. So if you use lead, which does not react with water and with air violently, then you can escape this, skip this intermediate circuit and make all the system, the construction cost and everything smaller and cheaper, of course. Also, it has high thermal capacity. We already discussed the beneficial uh, properties of the lead in this case. However, we have a problem with lead because it's uh, erosion and corrosion. So this uh, with lead and, and structural materials, you have to co control the oxygen level very accurately, not to avoid elimination of the oxide level on the construction, construction materials, or not to make this oxide level is too big so it can be broken and you, you, it can block the flow passes also. This is one disadvantage of lead. And uh, also the problem with lead, it uh, it's has very limited operational experience. We never had these uh, reactors for generation electricity except a uh, small experience with Russian submarines uh, uh, working on the lead with metal tactic. That is the problem, but this is very promising uh, technology. And we have many, many numerous, I would say, a lot of designs of the reactors new uh, with lead or lead with metal tactic, many of them. One of them is already under construction, is Brest OD300 in Russia. But there are several other designs which are very promising, like Wissingauss LFR, Mira in Belgium. I'm not sure it's a little bit postponed but it's accelerated driven systems. We know the people here who are working on ADS also. And Amphora Shapes, LFR, IS-200 reactors, which is now get new investors and new plus. And also Sealer 55 megawatt LFR developed in Sweden. Okay, gas, helium has 
a lot of advantages is, is completely transparent to neutron solar. It can, you can reach very high neutron spectrum. It's low reactivity insertion, chemically inert, and also always the same phase already gases, optically transparent, not conducting electricity, and can be applied for the very high temperature applications. However, it requires huge uh, pressure to operate because, you, because, helium, because of the density of the helium. And then you have to create a uh, reactor vessel with high pressure. So it can be, okay, the gas is non-condensable also, so it it's makes, in case of a loss of coolant accident, could be problem and have low thermal inertia, so it, reactor core can heat up rapidly if it forced into hot. And also, again, there is no operation experience with helium at all. One example of the helium gas course reactor is GFR Allegro, which is de under development in Europe. However, it's still, uh, uh, it's a huge power reactor, but, uh, and under development, but still need to be, I believe it will be, it takes more years to do. Molten salt reactors are very popular now. There are different types of molten salt reactors. I mean, very, very popular in designs because of their, you know, obvious uh, features. For example, first of all, natively, it, it's, uh, when temperature rise, the, it, it's expand fuel, molten fuel expand, and then auto you automatically reduce the reactivity so there is no problem. And uh, also <coughs> heat is released together with coolant altogether. V very, very interesting design. However, the experience with molten salt is also to be proven. It's, it's under operation. So I will skip a couple of slides. There is one concept which combines molten salt technology, let's say, and, so, and traditional sodium cooled fast reactor. It's a new natrium reactor announced by Terra Power which has actually the normal SFR with 345 megawatt electric, but it's combined with uh, storage system, which is filled with molten salt, which is, remember, it has huge heat capacity. So in this case, let's say when the electricity is not required, reactor is working to heat up this molten salt and store energy there. And when, let's, again, Let's say in the sunny day, we have the solar panels which generate electricity, and then the, the clients don't need uh, electricity from the nuclear power plant. In this case, you store energy in molten salt, but when night comes, then you need some, you need, or evening, you need some electricity, then you can generate electricity from stored molten salt, and in this case, reactor peak power can reach 500 or 600, so double, actually, of the nominal power of SFR. And also this can be used for non-electrical applications and work with renewable, again, when you have this uh, depending on sun. So main problem with renewables, uh, is, you know, of course, you have wind, you have generation, you have sun, you have generation, and, and vice versa, okay? But for the for nuclear power plant, you won't always work on 100% of power. For this, if it's energy not required, you can store it, with, for example, in this case, in molten salt, and this is storage is allowed. <coughs> this is reactor is announced by Terra Power, which is one of the main you know, investors is Bill Gates, as you know, and even he is very enthusiastic. You see these shapes of the reactors here. Supercritical water cooled reactor is also very interesting concept under development, but it's not like near future, I believe. I just want to skip both slides because it will be explained to you in other presentations. And uh, be before I complete that, I just want to show the challenges that for innovative fast reactors also, which is most of them are fast reactors, fast neutron spectrum reactors, there are several challenges. Uh, at present, we, the most of mature technologies is, is sodium-cooled fast reactors with oxide, metal, or nitrate fuel as well. This is what we know. 
However, it seems important to develop a, a viable backup option such as lethal at least smooth coolant with oxide or nitrate fuel, or maybe also gas coolant and with carbide fuel, it was the idea, which is not very popular now, or molten salt cooled reactors also. And, uh, okay, let me just, for the sake of time, just to show you the status now fast reactors in operation and under construction and decommissioning. In Russia, again, we have <coughs> these four reactors, which is uh, two of them, three of them, sorry, in operation, and beer is under construction, and breast oil, breast rehangat is under construction again. And in China, CFR is in operation, and two units of CFR 600 under construction, India has PF, PF, sorry, FBTR in operation, experimental reactor, and PF bar under commissioning already. Japan, Monjo, and Joy, Joy experimental in uh, awaiting expected license renew and starting operation again, and Monjo is under decommission. You see here, all, almost all of them are of sodium cooled reactor, except breast rehangate, which is new. This is what reactors, which are real reactor, which will be operating in, in coming years soon. However, if you look at the picture of the reactors under development and design, in this case, at least half of them are uh, lead cooled past reactors, and we have also several reactors with another coolants. I put it bold here, the, let's say most, real, we don't know which is most realistic, by the way, but just following the news, what's an, an announcement, we can <coughs> see which reactors have better chances to be deployed, to be built and, de and deployed than others. So in this case, you see that now the most interest is moving to the lead from sodium, while sodium remains the mature main technology but lead is new and the development technology. In addition, we have gas cooled reactors and molten salt cooled reactors. And especially now we, we, we have the, this shift to the lower power reactors or SMRs. We'll have a lecture on SMRs next after me by Chirayu Batra, so I will let him to explain the benefits. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and ready to answer your questions, please. Yes, please, but please, please come here because I know that we have only one microphone here that's working. We want to hear the online audience as well. Thank you. Uh, I don't understand. Uh, uh, you spoke about uh, a first uh, nuclear reactor, and uh, I remember that uh, F1 uh, was a first reactor, or uh, you include a industrial. Reactor. We talk about the, the reactors that generated electricity. Okay. <laughs> there are many other experimental reactors, of course, also. And f three years later in Obninsk, we had this first industrial nuclear power plant that was already five megawatt electric. In case of the e EBR-1, it was only like, just to demonstrate few bulbs, lamps, simply, it was I believe it was three or five kilowatt, finally, the total el electric power. But that was the first nuclear reactor that generated electricity. Please come here to ask questions. And also we, I know how we do it, but. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a question about the uh, best practice and uh, if uh, experimental of the using these uh, generation reactors. Uh, as you present uh, uh, about the development of technology, uh, only the SFR is the only technology that have a experimental data. But in, uh, SFR in compare with the PWR have many disadvantages also. But we say that it's a generation uh, for reactors. Uh, and other design, all of the other design are the uh, showcase and uh, uh, for, for a nuclear development. For example, I 
Uh, I participate from two years ago in a new generation reactors, and all of the uh, presentation is about the benefits. The, all of benefits, but nobody talk about the challenges. We have many challenges. So there isn't in any experimental data about these designs. It's a big challenges f for development. And uh, also, uh, uh, you say that uh, most of the designs concentrate on a uh, lead fast reactor. But also, we don't know about the uh, phenomena that be in, uh, occurred in the future for lead fast reactor also. Uh, so, uh, I, I want to ask you about we need to nuclear power plant for an uh, uh, early, er, in earlier replacement uh, with the uh, generation four, with the uh, past generation reactors. So, I want uh, uh, to know about your opinion about uh, which of designs uh, go, uh, really go to the uh, uh, toward the uh, best uh, replacement with the PWRs. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question and raising this important issue also. Uh, okay, uh, for the, I don't agree that we don't have a lot of experience. For the lead, we have now a lot of experiments also, for example. We don't have experience in the real reactor operation, except these uh, submarines which is very limited and actually not available also to, for general. But, however, the lead was chosen because of the disadva disadvantages of sodium are obviously. It's, it's violent chemical reaction with water, it can happen. And also in case, of, in case of Monju, it was a leakage of sodium, not many, by the way, but because of fire. And frankly, is the main problem with leakage of the sodium in Monjo was because it was JNC was trying to hide this accident from the public. And then they lost public support and acceptance. And that was because actually s such kind of leakages happens with sodium and they're not very dangerous in, 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 uh, unless you, you, you get direct in contact with water, with air. It's a fire, but it's a small fire. It's very small fire, like, which will, can be easily managed. But, but the problem is that it was a leakage. They didn't know, and they tried to hide. That was a problem. I mean, with sodium, we have million experiments also. With lead, also a lot of experiments now. And we don't expect the problem with lead, which is, and this is much easier, of course. And uh, how to replace, and why the generation four? Of course, I agree with you with the gas, for example, helium or supercritical water is completely also high pressure. Also, eh? And also, but with traditional PF bar, you have one problem, it's high pressure reactor, okay? And it's potentially has all, even with new and new safety measures, with everything, potentially physically can be dangerous, uh, can lead to the dangerous accident in case of se several of them. In this case, that's why this uh, ambient pressure reactors like sodium and lead, for example, are considered as generation four. If I may add something, Vladimir, to that, what you said. Yeah, uh, wait, wait, wait a moment, wait a moment, yeah. Okay, sure. Let's give a discussion. So, sorry. <laughs> For example, for PWR, for thermohydraulic, we have a more than a 140 experimental test data about the TIF just for thermohydraulic. We have a various design of the uh, generation, five, uh, uh, generation four reactors, but lack of the experimental. It's very big challenges with this variety and it, uh, as a researcher and nuclear engineering, uh, when, you, uh, when, when, when anyone asks uh, ask about the future of the Generation 4, it's a very big issue. Uh, we need to concentrate it more about the technologies uh, and the best technologies for replacement. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you for your comment. Now, Mr. Batra, Chirayo Batra. 
please. Yeah, I was just adding to that. <clears throat> I think the prime reason to move to Generation 4 is actually outlined in the these four goals that Generation 4 represents, which are safety, sustainability, economics, and proliferation resistance. So if we talk about these four goals, first, let's say talk about sustainability, we have to see how we can maintain the current fuel cycle. I mean, we can assume that the current uranium resources are enough, but they might not be enough if we want to continue this cycle for, for a longer time. And in terms of safety, also one of the key points that uh, Vladimir mentioned is the, is the most of the systems are pressurized, the, the pressurized water reactor or boiling water reactor. And they itself create a lot of complications in terms of safety. So when we depressurize the system, it eventually leads to a lot of, it eventually eliminates a lot of accidents that you can expect in a, in a pressurized system. Now, talking specifically on the experimental facility, what I think and what I believe in is that the nuclear industry has a very strong regulatory process. So if the regulation, regulatory process, if the reactor design goes through the regulatory process, that means there has been enough evidence that the reactor will operate safely and will not cause any harm to the, to the ambience. And with this, what I feel is that if, the, if there is not enough either physics proof or enough experimental proof, the reactor will not be licensed. And that we can for sure rely on nuclear industry. This has never happened before. This is not going to happen later as well. Now, specific issues of safety, which comes with sodium, like sodium fire, for me, I believe it's not a very big issue because the sodium fire is manageable. And these are engineering solutions that we can have for that. So in case we have an engineering solution, we can move ahead. I mean, if we, if you, if you do not believe in engineering, what's going to happen is that we had boilers which were blasting every day, and now we have boilers in in our homes which just rarely or they just never blast because the engineering solutions are there which keep them safe. Yeah. So the whole idea, what I feel here is that to move towards a technology which has more sustainability goals and more safety goals. But the process takes time. And for that, I think there are enough experimentation that is happening. The industry has enough regulatory process that makes sure this is going to happen. It's happening. And then the important thing is economics. So if the reactors cannot compete on cost with other sources of energy, this is the death of nuclear. So we have to make sure the economics is good. And for that, I feel that the generation four reactors could actually work on improving the economics of the reactor. That's all for my side. OK, thank you. We can continue with this. Can you hear me? Can you? Everybody? Can? Yeah. yeah, we yeah. We can continue this, this. Remember, that was just quick introduction, very small introduction. All details you will receive later in the, our lectures on different types of directors, and you can ask questions also. Any other questions here? Yeah, sure, please. Ms. Lai, it was shown that uh, BN uh, 600 or 800, <clears throat> any of them has like lower power density? And my question is how much lower it is, and is it lower than the regular PWR reactor? I mean, we know that SFR has much more higher power density than PWRs. I mean, why was it said that it's lower? Okay, lower because lower, it, traditionally the fast reactors like BN600, for example, I'm talking, uh, they had much higher power density than, than water reactors and PFWR. And the, the core was very small, like one meter and like several three meters diameter and one meter old. And that was considered as a benefit. But then it becomes, I mean, uh, theoretically, yes, you, you want to have a release. You have smaller core and release more energy in the smaller core, yes. But from the safety point of view, it was to know that it, it would be better to have lower density, so it means bigger core with the same power, okay? And that was the lower power density for BN 800, and for BN 1200, it will be even more lower. It's for the safety reason also, not simply. But it's still higher than P P PWR. <laughs> yeah. Yes, this is intentional because it was considered as a benefit from the very beginning, but then it, it, it turned out that it could be, why should we make it all power in the very small? Okay, we can afford a little bit more because it doesn't require more structural material. It's still the reactor vessel is the same size. Any, so any other questions from the uh, online audience? If you want to raise your hand, please. No? Then I think we should go because we are already ahead, like half an hour lost, because you take very long coffee breaks, guys. 
Now I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Chirayo Batra to deliver, to start his presentation on small and medium-sized or modular reactors. <coughs> which is actually... Hello everybody, can you see my presentation, right? 